to do this? How do I, how do I get the stuff I'm after? So I pour this stuff on top, and I start collecting in a tube every drop that comes out. Here's a tube for a drop, put it over here. Tube for a drop, tube for a drop. So I start collecting drops, okay? And so the very first ones that come out will be the protein, the big protein. The next set coming out will be the middle-sized proteins, and then the last set will be the small ones. Yeah. And they won't come out all in one tube. They'll typically come out over, over a range of several tubes. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason that the big ones come through first, good question. The reason that the big ones come through first is they just bounce from bead to bead to bead to bead to bead. They just go boing, 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 and they're through. Instead of going, what's that? On the outside of the beads. Right. So there's a lot shorter space for them to go. The small ones are going in those same spaces as well, but they're also going through the tunnels. So they've got a longer path that they've got to go through to get there. Yes, Lynette. It's almost exclusively large. Yeah. Yes. Good question. Is there another way to get them out besides gravity? For gel filtration, gravity is about the only thing that's used. There are other technologies I'll describe that use pressure to get things through. That's not necessary for gel filtration. Okay. How am I doing on time? Oh, getting there. Okay. All right. So there's a couple of cool technologies. Here's one that you'll say, oh, it solves all the problems. This one is another type of chromatography, and it also uses beads. So I've described three things with beads. I described the ion exchange chromatography. I described the gel filtration chromatography. And now I'm going to describe something to you called affinity chromatography. And this one is very easy to understand. Okay? This one doesn't take a lot of, of um, complicated explanation. Let's say that I am interested in a particular protein, and this particular protein binds to something like ATP. A lot of proteins bind to ATP and use the energy of ATP to do something. Okay? So I say, I've got a protein. I'm interested in this protein that binds to ATP. Okay? Can I use that information as a way of purifying this protein? And the answer is, yes, I can. I take my beads. And I chemically attach to those beads ATP. So now instead of having positive things or negative things that are out there, I've got beads that have hundreds of ATPs sticking out on them. OK? You with me so far? I take my mixture of proteins that I've squirted out of my cells, and I pour it on the top. What's going to stick to the column? What's going to stick to a column that's full of ATP? protein that binds to ATP. So I'm using the affinity of that protein for ATP to hold on to ATP, uh, to hold on to the protein. Okay? So the protein sort of selects itself. Now, you might say, well, do you get pure protein? The answer is no, I don't, because there's a lot of proteins that bind to ATP. But on that column, I'm only going to have proteins that bind to ATP, no other proteins. That's kind of cool. Let's say I'm working with a protein that binds to a molecule and no other proteins bind to that molecule. I've got a one-step way of purifying my protein. I take a bead, I attach that molecule to it, I pick, pour this whole mixture through that doesn't bind to that molecule and only my protein is going to bind to it. I've got a very simple way of purifying my protein. Affinity chromatography is a very, very powerful tool. Everybody understand that? Yes? That's a chemical process. We won't go through that here. But it's chemically, it's chemically and covalently attached to the bead. Yes? I'm sorry? Good question. OK, I was waiting for that question, actually. Thank you. How do I get the protein off the bead? Based on what I told you of the, of the ion exchange chromatography, what do you suppose I would use to get the protein off the bead with? What's that? Yeah. Not PI. How about ATP? The protein wants to bind to ATP, so if I start running ATP through the column, 
Guess what the protein, when it lets go of one, is going to grab a hold of the other, and now it's not attached to the bead and it goes through. All of these bindings that we're talking about are not covalent. Remember I talked about BPG and I said it wasn't a covalent binding. I said the BPG came on and it went off. The same thing is happening with these proteins that are on the column. They're binding ATP and they're sort of coming on, coming off. They don't make it very far because there's ATP surrounding them and they kind of get stuck. But when I put ATP in the column, now when it grabs a hold of one of those ATPs, what happens? It's not stuck to a bead. It starts coming through. So ATP will release it from a column if it's a, an ATP binding protein. Yes, sir? So if it's only one active binding site, though, between the protein and ATP, then you know, what makes it more definitive is one ATP over the other being pouring through? None whatsoever. But once it comes off, it's going to bind. If I flood it with ATP, it's much more likely it's going to bind to the loose ATP than to the tight ATP. OK? The important thing about these bindings that we're talking about is they're not covalent. They're not permanent. It comes on, it goes off. It comes on, it goes off. And once it comes off, it binds a new one. If I can get it to bind a new one that's a loose one, it's just going to come shooting through the column. OK, you guys are looking tired, as you always are in the afternoon. So hopefully uh, that all made sense. We will pick it up on Friday. Have a good day off tomorrow. How you doing? Good. Good, thank you. On that last step, so now that you've gotten the uh, protein from the uh, ATP in the column, yep. but now it's still attached to ATP in yep. the jar, how do you get it from away from that ATP? Oh, and that one? Yeah. Um, I don't even necessarily need to. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it kind of depends on what I'm trying to do. Uh, in many cases, all I care about is the protein. Um, if you think about this, um, in a lot of cases, pr um, um, proteins that are binding to a molecule are letting go of it periodically. So I have ways of separating a big, a big molecule like a protein from a small molecule. I could take it and then run it through, and I uh, through a, a gel filtration after that. Okay. So I would get the ATP stuck in the beads, and the protein would come out. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I have a question about um, the test. Is it going to be during normal uh, class normal time? Normal huh? Excellent. I just have a biology exam at that point, so at uh, like 7.30 at night. Lucky you. Well, you don't want to stay. We can stay here until maybe 6.30 or so at night working no, on the... No, thank you. <laughs> Hi. What's um, up? I just had a question about the prions. When they form the aggregates, are yeah. they form them inside the cell or are the proteins being released and they're... Like That's a good question. I believe they're actually forming, um, let me think about that a second. I think they're forming outside the cell, but I can't tell you that for sure. It's a very good question. I haven't thought about it in a while. Maybe the prions in my, in my brain are starting to fold and I, and I can't remember. Um, along the same lines, I was wondering, you said there's, you said there's an accumulation of something in the brain? Yep. Plaque. They're called plaques. Yeah, they're oh, called amyloid plaques. Amyloid plaques. Yeah, and the plaques that form in the brain are not unlike ones they find in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. Okay. Alzheimer's doesn't have a prion, so that's not a prion. Okay. But um, in Alzheimer's, you see plaques that form also for other reasons. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the plaques are really nasty for the nerve cells. That's the problem is you're killing nerve cells. And in Alzheimer's, of course, you have dementia for other reasons. Are they like toxic, or how do they kill the nerve cells? They're bulky, and they squeeze them out, basically. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's a physical thing that they're actually doing. Okay. Yeah. Okay.